This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames are back on the ice, and as always, I'm Dan Stevenson alongside my co-host Matt DeBorg, and we're back to talk about what we'll call the second half of the Calgary Flames season. Uh, Matt, we talked last week during the bye week, which was episode 199, and this is a big one for us. This is episode 200. Yeah, it's nice that we hit that milestone, and back when we started, it was, again, I was still on the team and all of that, and... I had a feeling that it'd take until about episode 200 for the Flames to get good again, and sure enough, they're doing awesome, and hopefully that can continue for the next 100 episodes Well, let's so. let's round down a bit. They started doing well about episode 185, 180, somewhere in there. Yep. So the Flames are back on the ice. They're back from the bye week, and they played two games this week, both on the road. Um, let's jump right to those. The first game was on February 1st. The Calgary Flames went into Washington to take on the Capitals without Alex Ovechkin and still ended up losing in a 4-3 game against the Capitals. I've got to say, from my vantage point, I think the Flames were lucky that it was 4-3. This did this team looked like I expected them to, and I predicted last week it looked like a team coming off a bye week, didn't it, Matt? Oh, for sure. And you had to figure that Washington had struggled heading into the break, and they desperately needed two points. And Calgary... At the beginning part of the game, it looked like they were trying to be too fancy. And I think they kind of took the Capitals a little lightly just because, oh, Ovechkin's not there. And it, frankly, like, I thought Smith played all right. I didn't have much of a problem with any of the goals that he gave up. So, you know, all in all, it was a game, and they lost. Like, you know, it's one of the elite teams in the NHL, the defending Stanley Cup champions, you're not going to win 82 games, and it was a tie game until less than a minute left to go. And if we're going to lose, I guess if we're going to lose a team to a team that's an elite team, I'd rather we lose to an elite Eastern Conference team. Oh, for sure, and keeps us ahead of like the Sharks and the Jets and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it, it just doesn't sting as much when it's not somebody that you're directly competing with. Um, I guess the big news out of this game for Flames fans was the Travis Hamannick injury. It was uh, partway through the first, I don't know the exact time here, Hamannick left the game, came back later, and then left again because he was still in pain. And we know this is a tough guy. Like, he played the whole game after he broke his jaw. So for him to have had to leave, you know that he's pretty seriously hurt. Yeah, and thankfully, uh, according to Peter Lubardius, uh, Hamannick had an MRI in Calgary today and it seems to not be as bad as they were expecting. And I think that they were expecting him to be out for a month or more. Uh, just like, cause it looked like he like p- tweaked his MCL or something like that in his knee. And usually that takes about a month, month and a half to get back from. So it doesn't appear to be that severe. I don't think that you'll see him for like another week or so just because, you know, you don't want to rush him back too soon and just run with what we've got and I think especially because of the opponents coming up this week it's not the end of the world if Hamnick takes a couple days off well that's what I was about to say this team's in an interesting spot now where you know we want to start thinking ahead to the playoffs and you don't want to rush a guy back in the lineup where it might affect his ability to play well down the stretch or even in the playoffs. And if you look, the Flames now have a three-day break, and then they play two more teams than a two-day break. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I honestly wouldn't even be surprised if they kind of keep him off the ice until they're back home against Arizona on the 18th. Yeah, uh, there's no rush, you know. And especially, like, Dalton Prout, uh, he played in the Carolina game. I thought he was actually quite excellent in that game he played about 15 minutes and other than the one highlight of him doing a pirouette in the defensive zone 
he played very solid, and I think that the Flames could easily get by for a few games with having Prout on the blue line, or Stone if he returns from his blood clots sooner than later. Either way, I think the Flames should be fine for a couple of games without Hamnick. Matt, can you say that again? Because it'll probably never be said about Prout again. What? Or sort uh, well, what's your how how well good you thought he played? That's not something you usually say about Dalton Prout. I know. Well, it, you have to give credit where credit's due, and he came in cold, uh, hasn't played in a long time, and I thought he was excellent, frankly. And I had zero complaints other than that one that like everybody's pointing out of oh he sucks but you know like it was one bad play out of the whole game and he was on the first pairing of the defense uh, on the penalty kill the penalty kill went four for four we scored a goal on it so uh, there i it's rare to give praise to a ninth defenseman but he stepped in really well and uh, you know if the flames need him for a while that I don't see any reason that he can't just keep playing until Hamnick's 100%. Well, and the other option they've got is they did make a recall to fill that spot. They went to Stockton and called up uh, defenseman Renat Valiev, who they brought in from... The, he came over in the Kulak trade along with Tara Vinen. A 23-year-old from Russia, shoots left. Um, he played for the Canadians last season in two games and then in 2015, 2016 for the Maple Leafs in 10 games. So far this year with Stockton, he's played 36 games, one goal, 11 assists, and 12 points. I thought it was an interesting call-up to bring up a guy like this who we never thought when we acquired him we'd see in a Flames jersey and not to bring up a guy like Yusuf Valamaki, who we know is down there. Especially if, and I mean, that could always change as well if we know this guy's going to get some play time. But were you surprised that uh, Valiev came up and not Yuso? Not really. Uh, I think the Valmaki needs ice time and not to just sit on the bench. And Valiev is not not great, but he the odds of him actually playing are virtually zero. I don't uh, think he's much worse than Dalton Prout, if at all. No, and that's the thing, like. He's okay. Like, it'd be like literally like having Kulak in there. Like, it, it, it's okay. He's there. He's a body. He'll play 8, 10 minutes. Who cares? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you about you. So I think especially coming off an injury, he needs the big minutes. And that was one of my criticisms is not giving those young defensemen that we had big, enough minutes. Um, so I think it's good to keep him in Stockton. And, yeah, especially if the guy's not planning to play or play – bottom pairing i don't see any reason to rush you so back up here you know this call up is just fine yep um and even if he plays in a couple of games i mean you know yeah on the bottom pairing you can only do so much damage as well if you're not hurting the team oh you're i know only playing, it, what, six minutes a night yeah and like especially like if he's especially bad in a game then you just have him sit and just run with five defensemen because yeah, the Flames have do done that, that before. And, you know, like, if he's terrible. Like, I remember that one game that Tim Ramholt played for Calgary, and he made a mistake 45 seconds into his NHL career, and that was the end of his NHL career. <laughs> wow, there's a name I didn't think I'd hear again. Tim Ramholt. Yeah, so, you know, like, if Valiev struggles to that extent, like, I think that he'll just be taken out of the rotation and we'll just run with 5d for the rest of the night tim rommel is still playing believe it or not yeah he's a defenseman for hc davos of the swiss league well it's not a bad place to play you know switzerland's awesome so might as well i mean if i recall correctly he is swiss so and then the second game this week the calgary flames we saw them beat up on the hurricanes at home before the break and now they went back to um they went back to the Hurricanes to play in their barn in Carolina. And interesting game here. The Calgary Flames got goals from all the former Hurricanes. Lindholm's 23rd, Ryan's 5th. Uh, Hathaway scored, but he doesn't count. And then Hannafin's 5th Well, it was assisted by Ryan. So, and Ryan, there you go. Ryan set the table for a tap-in. So. so points from every goal had at least one point from a former Hurricane. Yeah. Um, it would have been funny if Bill Peters like swatted from the bench and put it in there. 
Well, he got two points at the end of the night, so it's all good. So, yeah, they beat up on Peter's former team, and this was a 4-3 uh, to three win. And I thought more so in this one than in the Washington game. I thought that this score told told a bit more of the story. I didn't think that, you know, I didn't think the Flames played really well in the Washington game. I think they were lucky to have as close a score as they did. I liked the way the Hurricanes played here, and it seemed like the Flames were still getting out of that uh, post-break funk, but you could tell that they had some motivation here. Yeah, and each one of the former Hurricanes was very enthusiastic about returning home, and... You know, like, uh, honestly, that whole uh, Lindholm clapping thing, I I find that quite hilarious, personally. Um, it, For those that it, didn't watch the game, explain it to everyone. Oh, at the end of the game, uh, like, Lindholm was always a player that gave his all for Carolina when he was there, and he didn't prefer to be traded. And so he was expecting that he'd get a cheer or something from the Hurricanes fans, but instead he was relentlessly booed all night along with all the other Hurricanes players. So once the game ended, he uh, mocked the Hurricanes using their victory celebration because all of the players go to center ice and do this over-the-head clapping thing, uh, which is like a hurricane warning or something, storm warning for hand signals. So, yeah, and he was mocking them and then getting relentlessly booed by doing so. And then Riddick and joined in. he's out in. of there and doesn't have to go back. Yeah, and Riddick joined in because it's hilarious, and Neil had a good laugh, too. So, <laughs> it, it's all good. You know, and Lindholm went from being, I like this player, to now he and Kachuk are my two favorite players on the team. <laughs> there you go, you're going to have to go get a Lindholm jersey. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I thought it showed a different side of Lindholm, which we haven't seen. And this now, just for the record, now concludes the Flames series against the Hurricanes this year. So we won't see them again until next year. You got to wonder how odd it was for Bill Peters to walk into the other dressing room in this rink. Yeah, true enough. Like, you know how muscle memory takes over sometimes? You wonder if he, like, wanders into the other one. Oh, sorry, guys, wrong room. Yeah. I don't know how enthusiastic those players would be to see him. Or or even if he would know where the away dressing room is. He had no reason to go in there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the Flames now uh, had that road trip. They've concluded a road trip. They come back home this week, play one home game, and then another road trip. So it's the clean underwear stop, as it's been called by some alumni that I've talked to. Yep. So after this week, the Calgary Flames are sitting at 73 points in the season. That's a record of 53 games played, 34 wins, 14 losses, 5 overtime losses. Uh, that puts them 3 points up on Winnipeg, who are at 70, and San Jose is at 67. Nashville is at 66. And if we look on the other side, we've got Tampa Bay at 80 points. So we're closing that gap, at, not only on Tampa Bay, but... Um, closing the gap between us and San Jose too, and that's slowly slipping away from them. Yeah. Well, that's why it's imperative that the Flames just keep winning as much as possible. And they showed a graphic during one of the intermissions of the Carolina game that showed that only two teams have an easier schedule for the rest of the season than the Calgary Flames. So Calgary should be able to make some hay down the rest of the road. It's just that they have to actually follow through and like the Carolina game and beat them when, you know, they are facing a mediocre team. Yeah. I think more so now than before the break, man management is going to become really important. And what I mean by that is even a guy who should be playing a lot of minutes and maybe limiting those minutes in games that aren't as important to keep guys healthy. Um, you know, I can see a game like the Florida game coming up of, limiting some of, you know, maybe our star players and giving some not-so-star players more minutes and maybe sitting guys out more often than they usually would just to keep everyone healthy. Yeah, so, like, having basically everybody around 15 minutes each, give or take, and not, you know, having, like, the fourth line playing five minutes or something like that. Yeah, or even, I mean, I could see if the team gets up, say, four or five goals of even, you know, starting to limit the first line's continued play after that yeah 
Or as we were mentioning earlier, even Hamannick, like you said, not rushing him back in the lineup just because he's Travis Hamannick, but saying, hey, why don't you sit out a couple extra games just to limit, you know, your exposure? Yeah, and like that's why I think that Smith or a new backup will play it a little more than what I think some people would expect and just to keep Riddick fresh for the playoffs because I don't think he's played more than 50 games in a season before and he's on pace to do that this year so it's one of those things that like the more that we keep players fresh the more likely that things will go good as we get to the playoffs one thing i do expect is that the flames will get a backup goaltender just due to the fact that in the playoffs you need to have a legitimate second option uh, instead of your starter in case the starter has a bad game or two because uh, you don't want to lose a series just because the one guy's gone cold for a bit and like we saw with uh, previous cup champions uh, the last few years that they were pretty much bounce back and forth between their goalies yeah well let's talk about that i mean we've talked in the past about trades and the trade deadline approaching and what might come um you know for the flames or what the flames might give up and matt there's been some i mean you and i've speculated you've had some speculation especially but some of the experts in the field now are starting to speculate on what they're hearing or think might happen so let's talk about some of these. Uh, Elliot Friedman on his 31 Thoughts podcast said that the Flames may be working with the Rangers to try and land Matt Zuccarello. And for those that don't know, uh, Zuccarello is a left shot right winger, uh, 31 years old. This season he's played 37 games, has nine goals, 19 assists, and 28 points. What are your thoughts on the Flames potentially bringing in Zuccarello? Oh, uh, the play good probably the best player in Norway's history. Uh, he's all right. Honestly, like him, he's basically like a similar profile of player as Nyquist. Uh, just because I know that like, our listeners have heard me speak on him so much. It's just that he's like the poor man's version of Nyquist. And if it's cheaper to get Zuccarello and you don't have any intention of bringing him back, sure. Like, if it only costs you, like, a third or something equivalent therein, awesome. But I think that if you're going to, like, spend the first round pick, I think that you're going to want a player that's better than Zuccarello. Zuccarello's making $4.5 million, so think for leak money for those that just want comparisons. And he would be a rental. So 31 he would be a rental. I really believe you could get him for pretty cheap. Yeah, um, he's also a good two-way forward, and he does have some good offensive skills, and like he'd fit in with the Kachuk line not without a problem. Uh, yeah, it, and, and, well, and even I could even see him as a third line type guy. Like I don't think that's a guy you have to necessarily slot into the top six. No, true enough, and he can play at both ends of the ice, so it really doesn't matter if he's on the second, third, or fourth line. He'll perform well, regardless. So as a if we're gonna go out and get a rental of the names that we've talked about over the last little bit, I quite like Zuccarello as a guy who could fill that role. Yeah, I, if it's me, and I think the asking I'd price would be, be right. Yeah, like that would be like one of the better bargain basement bin type guys, like for the type generic type of depth forward. Uh, if you're going to go all out, a couple of his Rangers teammates, Kevin Hayes and uh, Chris Kreider, would be more of what I'd be looking at. I've always liked Kreider. I think he's a bit of a jerk in the same way that Kachuk is, and I think that would be a good fit. Um, I think Kreider's going to be expensive, and there's going to be a lot of teams that want that kind of grit. Yeah, and that like if you're going to go and spend... Getting a guy like Kreider would make some sense. If I was going to spend, I'd rather spend on Wayne Simmons. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I I I view them I think as kind Simmons of a, is a more complete player. He can be a jerk. He can be the scorer. He kind of brings a little bit of everything, and I think yeah. he could fit whatever role we need him to for the limited time he'd be here better than Kreider could. Again, it it would depend on the acquisition costs. If all things are equal, it's a coin toss for me. But if one's clearly cheaper, then go with the cheaper version. 
Another name that Elliot Friedman put out here, and this is one that I'm questioning, uh, current Chicago Blackhawk Chris Kunitz, 39 years old from Regina. He plays left wing. Uh, this season he's played 30 games, one goal, two assists for three total points. To me, I'm thinking I would take almost anyone but Kunitz from from the Blackhawks. I actually don't mind the acquisition if you put it in proper context. He, if you're thinking of bringing him into play every night, then clearly there are better options. But Kunitz is one, I do believe, for Stanley Cups. So having a yeah, guy, right. you know, having a guy like that in the dressing room as like the 13th, 14th forward, that's not the worst thing. Yeah, that's true. If you, you know, it, 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 and you're not looking at, a high acquisition cost like frankly it'll be like a guy like spencer foo or you know probably even less than that frankly. i could see them doing some sort of like conditional sixth or seventh for kunitz yeah like if he plays like 30 games or something or 20 games or whatever yeah, flames make it to round three it's a fifth otherwise it's a seventh yeah i don't even think that would be that <laughs> you know like it, it if the Flames make the Stanley Cup Finals, you get a seventh round pick. <laughs> Otherwise, um, yeah, I not, guess from yeah. from the perspective you put out there, if we're not expecting him to play, yeah, it might be good to have him around the dressing room. I mean, he's played for the Ducks long time in the Penguins, the Lightning. He's played with some very successful teams, and like you said, he's been quite successful in the playoffs. Um, some years, even playing twenty four games in the playoffs, which is quite a bit of playoff hockey. So, yeah, just having him around, you're right, it might be good if we're looking at him as the 13th forward. Yeah, like I, that's why like when his name came up, I was actually like, oh, that makes some sense. Because you have to look at the fact that the Flames are extremely inexperienced when it comes to the playoffs. Like, frankly, like it's James Neal that's the only guy that has any real like long playoff runs as far as i know on the flames team so you know like, frankly like the flames don't really know how to win in the playoffs and having guys like neil and if they get kunitz it just helps to have like a coach so to speak that can say this is what you have to do in these situations in order to overcome whatever adversity they're facing during the playoffs because those guys have been around so much and frankly the flames don't have anybody like that so i i think it is necessary to get and especially like with the depth guys like i'm expecting the flames likely to add two depth forwards and one decent forward and maybe a depth defenseman and a backup goaltender and like a 13th a and yeah, thirteenth and fourteenth forward. And like, I don't even think they're going to cost very much. But if you can get some guys with some experience like that, and they don't cost much, if anything, then why not? Yeah, if we if we could get Kunitz for a sixth or seventh, I'd say let's do it. Um, like you said, he brings some good veteran presence. If you're not planning for him to play that often, yeah, it's sort of like. Uh, what was it a couple of years ago? Which I'm trying to remember. Which veteran goalie did they acquire from Minnesota Backstrom. at the deadline? Backstrom. Backstrom. And he yeah. he played like what one game? I think three or four actually. But was yeah. it okay? Yeah, he played yeah, against and, Minnesota twice. I know that, and I think okay. he played one other one. But okay. Yeah, but yeah, it, and that was more just to trade Jones and oh well, we need you to take a contract back. And, like, frankly, yeah. I think that Chicago would be just as happy not paying Kunitz. And, like, I, you look back to, like, the Max Reinhardt trade where, like, the condition was that Reinhardt had to play, I think it was, like, 30 games in the NHL for Nashville to give us a fourth-round pick. He didn't meet that threshold, so Calgary got literally nothing for him. And Yeah, well, same thing with the Freddie Hamilton deal, right? He had to play yeah. so many games in the NHL for us to give, uh, who was it, the Avalanche something. Yeah, and I think you could see the same thing with Kuna. It's like, if the Flames make the finals, then you get a seventh round pick. And I think that, you know, sort of like putting the guy on waivers without actually putting him on waivers. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, 
I think that got, there are a couple of guys like that that you can get for virtually nothing, and that will just help. And, like, frankly, if the Flames did run into injury trouble where they needed to play that 13th or 14th forward, I think there are a couple of guys on Stockton that would be more suited. But, you know, just having a guy like Kunitz there would help. I think you'd have to put Kunitz in a couple games. Yeah. Oh, sure, down the stretch, yeah, but... In the playoffs, I don't think you really have him out there. There's also that fancy term you said, waivers but not waivers. We can always trade for future considerations. Yes. And then the last name that's been associated with the Flames, and I actually kind of like this one, TSN's Craig Button suggesting the Calgary Flames do a deal with Ottawa, not for the player we're all thinking from Ottawa, but for uh, left left winger, left shot, 26-year-old, Ryan Dezingle is making one point eight million as a uh, as an expiring player, so he'd be a rental. I like the contract number on that, and I think if you're looking for a bottom six guy, Dezingle could fit in well. Yeah, uh, Dezingle can pr- play up a little more as well. He has a number of goals this year, a higher number. He's got 30, 39 points in fifty games. Yeah, so he you'd probably stick him on the second line. Uh, Frankly, I I wouldn't be objecting to that. You know, the, I remember back when Ottawa had uh, Tommy Wingles on his line, and that made for a great pairing, Wingles and Dezingle. But you know, um, I think that he'd be a good fit. I there are other players that I like better, but if the price is right, sure. And I, I think, think that, if you're simply looking at at a rental. I wouldn't go with Dezingle, but I think for, you know, we could probably re-sign him for cheap and keep him as a, as a you know, mid, middle uh, six forward for a pretty good price next year. Yeah, like I, I'd expect him to be in the full leak backland type money, like four and a half, five million a year for like three, four years. So not the end of the world. And frankly, you know, even if he regresses a bit, like it's still not the end of yeah, the world. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even know if he'd get that much. I think, especially coming off a year where he's one point eight, I think you could probably negotiate to about two five on a short term. Well, with the amount of points that he's had, it, I, I don't see it being less than four, just because teams always overpay. <laughs> I'd be okay with the Zingle coming in. I think that could work well. I don't know if I'd put him on the second line right away. I don't want to mess with that chemistry, but, um. You know, I think I'd maybe put him on the left wing with uh, Bennett and Neal and see if we can get going there. Frankly, I think there's probably about 20 players that would likely be available uh, that would make sense if the price is right. And you got to figure that one of them, w- the price will be right. So a deal will likely get done for a good quality player. It's just, it depends on who it is. And we all know that True Living's always working the phones, so we'll just have to wait and see exactly what they get. But I'm, I'd am i be, frankly, floored if the Flames don't add, like, three or four pieces at the deadline. Mostly so depth, talking guys. About, talking about what the price would be, um, Nick Kiprios came out and he said... And take it for what it's worth, because he didn't seem like he was that sure, but Kiprios thinks the Flames' first-round pick could be in play. And when I first heard that, I thought, no, don't trade your first-round pick. But the more I thought about it, this is going to be a pick that's going to be a very uh, high pick. It's going to be you know between probably 27 and 31. So if you look at the players lately that have come out of that and have stepped right in the NHL, I'd be willing to get, I wouldn't be willing to give that pick up for a rental. But I'd be willing to give that pick up for a longer term solution for this team. How about you? Well, that's the exact thing. Like, if this pick was like in 15 to 18, there's absolutely no way that I'd be advocating to trade it. But you have to look at like past drafts, like guys like Morgan Klimchuk, Emil Poirier. Like, there's a lot of just guys who, like, if they hit their potential, they're going to be a third line forward or a bottom pairing defenseman there's the odd one that actually works out to being a top tier player um like uh the ducks got with ricard raquel 
but more likely it's going to be a mediocre player. That being said, if you can get, a, say, a second line forward that you can keep for three or four years, then I don't see a problem with that. It, you know, like, that's basically what the upside of the pick is. And, okay, yeah, you have to pay the guy right away instead of developing him, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're also in a win-now situation, and if you can get a guy that you can keep for a long time that's not going to cost you several arms and legs, then I don't see a problem with that. And, frankly, like, the Flames don't need a star player in trade. No, they've got their stars. Yeah, like, they just need a good middle six forward. And and if, and if you look back at previous deadlines, I was doing that today on my lunch break, um, there are a lot of teams that will give up a first plus for a rental, and that I'm not okay with. But like you said, if it's a guy that can be here like a Dezingle or even a Zuccarello, if we could afford him, a guy that might be here for two, three years, yeah, let's make that deal. Yeah, and like if you look, say like any of the... Even a Gustav Nyquist who you've talked about in the past... I'd be willing to move that pick probably plus something to bring back a piece that could be here for two, three years. Yeah, and then you look at the team, and now you have two first lines, basically, with Kachuk, Backlund, and the new guy. The Monaghan line, of course. And then your third line is Jankowski, Bennett, and Neil. Like, that's a... And you can keep all of those guys... For the next three years. Well, and I you're... think Neil will get going before the playoffs, and I think that could almost be like a trade deadline acquisition in and of itself. Oh, I agree. I'm fully expecting him to have a good playoffs. It's just, and especially with his last two years, like the Flames are playing well, so like it's not imperative that he's flying right now. And I think that like once the games really start to matter as we get into March that you'll see his play steadily increase and he'll be more Neil like but you know the the team like if the the flames can pull that off and keep the guy that they acquire then like you can pretty much pencil the flames in for first place next year and because they'll just have more depth than literally every other team and, you know, you're now into, okay, what pieces do we need to win the Stanley Cup? And having that conversation instead. I think you're going to see the Flames make some hockey moves for roster assets at the deadline. And I don't think you see Tree move out all his picks at the draft again. But I do think you'll see him make some minor moves to pick up some picks and this year because our picks will be so low like i said i'm not convinced we need a first or we need certain rounds we just need a number of picks this team has shown that they can pick well in mid rounds but the, yeah like i, I mean, think their draft that, last year was awesome frankly like, but as uh, you and i saw a rookie camp there's just nobody in the system right i mean this rookie camp was mostly walk-on guys because there's simply nobody here so we just need to pick up even some fourth and fifth round picks just to get some prospects. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, the Flames have done a very good job with the picks that they've had. And, like, their sixth-round pick, Matthias Emilio Pedersen, his NHL equivalent number is virtually identical in his freshman year as Gaudreau's was. So, like, you know, like, he's playing that well in the NCAA. And... Yeah, I think that uh, D- Dmitry Zevgorodny is looking really nice, too. Yeah, so uh, the Flames, like, they just need to have some picks. And, like, if they keep that same mantra of just, I don't care if the player has, like, 15 things wrong with them. If they have the skill set that we're looking for, then awesome, because we can work on those things, other problems that they have. Like, either they're too small or whatever their problem is. You can't is. work on that one. We're not allowed to stretch people anymore. Yeah. Well, Gaudreau's now 5'9", apparently, so... <laughs> Good skate inserts. Yeah. <laughs> they, they won't let us put them on one of those medieval wheels and stretch the guys anymore. You don't get to leave till you're six foot. <laughs> um, so, outside of that first-round pick, what other assets do you think might be attractive or stuff the Flames might want to part with? When I look at the active roster, there's not a whole lot of 
pieces there that I think are really attractive. The teams are going to want. I think, you know, if we're going to move something like the Smith contract, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to take something back. I think even something like the Froleek deal this year isn't attractive. So I've put together a list of stuff that I think other teams might want and the Flames might be willing to part with. Tell me what you think of this list. On the defensive side, I think if teams call, they're going to be asking for Valimaki, and I think the Flames say no. I could see them part with Shillington. Um, I think that, you know, if you've got to give Sun up, he's the guy there. What do you think? Uh, frankly, to me, honestly, I think that the quad of Hannafin, Anderson, Shillington, and Valimaki are off limits entirely. And I'd be hard pressed to include any one of those guys in trade just because they're so young and they're playing so well at the NHL level that you don't really know what, especially like with the expansion draft that we're going to be talking about later, the, you don't know which one of those guys is going to emerge as being a top tier defenseman. And like all four of them are kind of heading in that general direction, but it, you know, there's going to be two years between now and the expansion draft. So I'm extremely reticent to trade any of those just because of the fact that you just don't know who of those guys will be a top tier player or if any. Yeah, no, I'm not saying they want to trade one, but I think if you have to move a young defenseman of those, I think Shillington's the guy they move out. I agree. I just, uh, I'd try to find some other way of structuring the trade. You don't have a nobody wants Matt Teravinen. Like if you got to move out a, a defenseman, you got few options. True. I just um, don't. Think, don't I, I just frankly don't think a defenseman will be included in any of the trades. So like unless it's Stone just to get rid of his contract, but I. But even it, then, I mean that's not going to be a lucrative contract. My question would be, what do we have to give up to get someone to take it? True. You know, like uh, it's it's like the Froelich deal. Probably more than want to pay him right now for where he's playing the lineup, but I don't know that I want to pay somebody to take that contract yet. Yeah, I well, think we will, and well, I think both those contracts, referenced... if we can wait a year, yeah. will be easier to move. Yeah, well, I think we even referenced it earlier with the Jones for Backstrom deal, where I think that like if the Flames say to a team, "Hey, we'll take your overpaid expiring player." here's a guy that you might be able to use for your rebuild. You know, have fun. If I remember though, Jones was expiring as well. So yeah, pretty much, you know, rental for rental. I think you'd be hard pressed to say to somebody, Hey, take on 4.5 million in, you know, Hathaway and, or in, sorry, for leak. And we'll just take, you know, an expiring contract. I think a lot of GMs would say, we'll keep the expiring contract and we'll take our chances in the summer and see if we can sign. True. True enough. Right. So um, here and then if we if we have to move some young forwards, the guys I'm thinking again, not saying I want to see them move, but just looking at assets I could see, you know, being useful to somebody. Dylan Dubé and Andrew Maggiapani, I think, would probably be part of a deal if we have to move some young assets. I don't necessarily want to see either of them moved as a homer. I like them, but I think those are probably if we look at NHL ready players. Uh, two guys I could see being included. Yeah, and you can even add Curtis Lazar to that. I think he's played so well in Stockton that he should be in the NHL right now. And frankly, Do you think would we can be get a, a second for him? No, but it might be a viable piece to include in a trade for a rental. It just, again, it depends on what the other parts are. And you mentioned uh, Spencer Fu earlier as maybe one of those death pieces that might move. I don't know that Fu's going to be in demand, but I could see Glenn Godden or Matthew Phillips moving. Or if we need to move a guy who's not pro yet, of even looking at an Adam Rzyska. Yeah. Frankly, I would not move Phillips at all just because of the fact that he's showing upper level skill. And like if he can play in the NHL... I think the Flames might have a high quality top six forward in him. And that level of potential, I'd be very reticent to trade just because of the fact that, you know, guys like that are so difficult to have and find. And if he can 
adapt to the professional leagues, then, you know, that's basically found money because he was a sixth round pick. Everybody else, though, like, if, like, if Dylan Dubé was what it took to get, say, like, Nyquist, sure. You know, like, you wouldn't be jumping up and down about it, but, you know, you'd be fine with it, and it'd be frustrating to lose either Dubé or Eat Bread, but you'd be fine with that as being, like, the key piece to the deal, and... Like, Phillips, I don't think, has high enough profile where he would garner much more than, like, a fifth round. I don't think he'd be a key piece, but I could see him being the and something. Yeah, and I'd rather find a different and, frankly. The one on this list that's kind of interesting to me is Glenn Godden. I mean, he had a good year last year in junior. He's coming to the AHL. He's looking okay, but I can see this being one of those guys, and they come around every couple of years, where teams want to take them on as a project. It's like, oh, Calgary doesn't know how to develop them. We'll take them on. And the name that always comes to mind when I think of that is Pavel Brendel. He got signed, and he got flipped from organization to organization because everybody thought they could do something with him. I could see Godden getting included in something instead of a draft pick, instead of us giving up, say, a fifth. We're like, yeah, we'll give you Glenn Godden. Yeah, I agree. And Godden's a very smart player. Uh, he's not the most talented of players, but his just raw intelligence on the ice is what's made him a decent prospect. And, you know, like, if it was, say, Kun- Kunitz for Godden, I don't think anybody would really complain that much about that. Uh, so Matt, you've talked about in the past guys like um, you know Gustav Nyquist, and we talked today about Dzingel and Zuccarello and Kunitz, and you know all these guys are great. And as a rental, it's easy to bring any guy in. But I think the thing we have to remember is two seasons from now there is an expansion draft, and if we look at bringing a guy in long term, especially a younger guy like a um, you know a Dzingel or a um, Gustav Nyquist. You could end up paying the price for that guy, signing him, and losing him for nothing. Are you worried if we go out and acquire something long term that it could affect, you know, what the Flames do at that expansion draft when uh, Seattle comes in? Well, frankly, I don't see that being too too much of a big deal. Like, if you look at the team as it sits right now, like you're supposed to protect seven forwards, three defensemen, and a goalie, or four forwards, four defensemen, and a goalie. And or ten total. Yeah, and I think that uh, Calgary would be fine if they uh, added another key forward to that group, uh, because of the fact that like right now the guy that would be seventh on my protect list would be Jankowski, and like Jankowski is a good player. I like him. But if that's all we had to surrender in the expansion draft, it'd be like, okay, sure. You know, like, we have to lose somebody decent, and, you know, like, at this rate, I would not protect James Neal. And, you know, the new guy, if he's good enough where he pushes Janko out, then, you know, it is what it is. And I think on the defensive side that you're going to just protect the three best young defensemen that you have and maybe flip a pick or something with that team to take one of the forwards if the fourth guy is really good. Yeah, I think this is a draft where, I mean, we got off pretty easy last um, last expansion draft with you know just losing England. But I, I honestly, and even then, we didn't technically lose him. He was free agent who signed there, I think. But um, I can see the next draft being one where the Flames are going to make a move to. I could even see them making a move to move something like the Fro Leak or the Stone contract if the guys are still around. Then, um, you know, I, I don't think Calgary's going to get away scot free, but I think that we can make a deal to lessen our impact. Yeah, and like if like say all four of the young defensemen that we were talking about end up developing into like the equivalents of guys like TJ Brody and good Giordano and that, well, you're not going to let one of them walk. So you're going to trade whatever top prospect you have at the time and a pick or something uh, to Seattle for them taking the forward guy that like you don't want to lose, but 
you're fine with. And I think that, you know, like, it would suck, but I think that's the route that if the defensemen all develop, then that's the route it'll go. And if only one of them flames out a bit, then you don't really have to worry about that at all. I'm pretty confident in Tree as far as his hockey knowledge that he's not going to leave Calgary high and dry with that expansion draft. I think, you know, we got to be careful who we bring in and how long we sign him for. But, you know, e- even if I could see the worst case scenario for the Flames being losing Bennett, and even that I'd be okay with. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, uh, you, the Flames are frankly in a spot where, like, we don't have a lot of high end guys coming up behind the guys that we already have which in a way like we have a limited number of really good players and like the rest of the guys are decent bottom end guys which that's useful but it's not like if you lose one of them you know is that guy not replaceable and I think you can say to a man like from Frolik down in the roster amongst the forwards if they were gone would you really care and most of them not really like if it came to that you'd be fine with any of them going well and by that point you get into a territory where these guys are replaceable i mean if we lose one you can go shopping july 1st and replace that asset if you want to exactly like if we lose a center like you know the flames will still be an elite team and you'll have literally every free agent knocking on your door. Like, I'd rather play for a contender than whatever that iteration of the Edmonton Oilers is. And, you know, so we'll see. Like, I'm not I'm not really even concerned about the expansion draft, frankly. I'm not too concerned. I think it's something that has to be in the back of, you know, the team's mind as they are making moves and signing deals, especially things like no trade clauses because we saw some teams get bit by those. I mean, this isn't Daryl Sutter where half yeah. our roster has a no trade. Can you imagine if that Flames team went into a an expansion draft? They would have been in trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, like I can see Kachuk maybe getting one. This team has to manage those carefully, but yeah. Oh yeah, I, I well, don't think you know, the elite much players. You just have to be careful yeah. who, how many long-term assets you acquire. Yeah, and frankly, like the Flames, like they're the key players that they have. Like they're either under contract or they're going to continue to be under contract for a long time. So, like, I don't really see any real dire need. Like, you know, it's not like that some teams where they had, like, say, like, Minnesota, where they had four really good young defensemen and they had to trade Alex Tuck and a pick, I do believe, to for uh, Vegas taking Hall out. And, you know, like, I don't think that the Flames are in a position right now where they're going to have to give up two high-quality parts of their team just to not take a defenseman or whatever. So we'll see. Like, I'm not... uh, Like, even though the Flames are one of the elite teams, like, there's still a clear divide between the extremely important players and the very good depth parts. And the depth parts are depth at the end of the day. And, you know, they're very important for the Flames being successful, but... It's not something that you go out of your way to like surrender prospects or picks for in most of their cases. I, I still have this weird feeling that Don Maloney might end up being the GM there, and with um, with Tree here, and with um, oh, who else did they bring in from that organization? They brought in a couple guys in the office who used to be there. Like, I think if if anyone could negotiate with him, it would probably be Tree to to lessen the blow. Yeah. You know, the student has become the master, and I think those two could work something out. Yeah. I'm really not concerned right now. Like, the Flames are in a weird spot where, like, I think when we get to that point, it might be more of an issue. Like, if, say, like, all four of the young defensemen become, like, top-ish pairing defensemen, then that'll be more of a problem than... 
you know, like if one of them's just a third pairing guy, because then you just leave him exposed, and if they take him, okay, who cares? Because that's just another good depth piece that goes away. Yeah, sorry, it's Maloney who's working here. He works as, a, I don't know, some sort of scout here. Yeah. Um, but I could see him, he's still a, a fairly recent GM. I could see him going over there. And they've got somebody who's who they've already hired who's a former GM. I don't even remember who it is. But anyway, yeah, I, I think I'm not too worried about it. But I thought it was something that we at least had to bring up. Yeah. Because, like, the Flames, like, say they get Nyquist and sign him to a 5-5 deal, like, the day they get him. Like, is he going to remain good throughout? Sure. Like, there's no indication that he's going to magically fall off a cliff. And he's not really taking any important player's spot on the protect list. So, at the end of the day, it sucks that we'll lose somebody, but... It, I don't really foresee any of the potential players that they'd pick up being an imperative, like, we need to give assets so they don't take that guy at this point. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's one of those things that some teams are going to get hit hard with the two expansion drafts. We got off pretty easy in the last one, so, it, you know, it's probably our turn to get hit. Yeah, exactly. Well... Uh, let's take a look. We've looked at at the Flames. Let's take a look down on the farm with the Stockton Heat. And uh, Stockton Heat still not doing too well this year. They're second last in the Pacific Division with 41 points. They have an 18-22-4 and four record. The bright spot this year was Yusuf Valamaki since going down at the bye week as three points in four games. And Matt, I was watching a lot of this team over the bye week because I needed my Flames hockey and I could sort of convince myself they're the Flames. They were the same colors. Um, they seem to be just like the Calgary team. A lot of third period come from behind efforts from this team. And just an interesting quote here from coach Kale McLean quote, resilience is always a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a positive bottom line. We're pro hockey players. We've got to find a way to not be coming from behind every third period. We like the fact this team can score and be relentless in terms of how we fight back in games, but we've got to do a better job overall and make sure we come out on the winning side End quote. Sounds like the Calgary team, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, we'll just wait until the third period and come out and get the job done. Yeah, it's like, oh, you've scored three goals on us. Okay, who cares? And then we score six. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Uh, frankly, like, Stockton just, they, they are suffering from just a lack of talent throughout. And I think the biggest thing from watching them is just a lack of talent on that blue line. Yeah. And, like, as we've seen in past years, like, if you have defense that are struggling, you're kind of screwed. And it doesn't matter how good your goaltending or forwards are. So, you know, look at Edmonton, for example. Like, the, their defense is horrible, and so are they, so. Um, but some interesting stats here. Stockton has erased third-period deficits in four straight games including each contest against San Jose this past weekend. The Heat are 1-3 in, in those games. Defenseman Renat Valiev, who we brought up, earned his second call-up to Calgary this season. I don't remember his first one, I think. If I remember, he was up here when we signed him because he had visa issues or something. No, uh, he came up, uh, I do believe, when Hamannick was hurt with uh, his jaw, if I recall correctly. And, okay. yeah, and... But he didn't play or anything. He was just, like, here for, like, a week and then went away again. And we talked about how Calgary has an easy schedule down the stretch. Stockton has uh, a divisional run of games with 14 games in a streak of 16 against Pacific opponents. So if you're trying to gain ground, that's the place to do it. But this team doesn't look like they're going to gain any ground. So I guess a good way to give up some points to other teams. And lastly, Curtis Lazar, we talked about earlier. He's found his way onto the score sheet in four straight games with two goals and two assists. Two on either side of the Lexus AHL All-Star Classic, where he looked pretty good as well. So there's some bright spots down there. It's not a great year for this team, and I think you're going to see a lot of defensemen um, coming into the draft for the Flames this year. Yeah. Or as college free agents. Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, If the Flames do have their first-round pick, I'm expecting a defenseman and... If not, like, their third round pick, I'm expecting for sure a defenseman. Like, whomever is the best of the fallers. Sort of like Adam Fox. And, you know, see what's available. 
and go that route. Uh, I'm expecting probably three or four defensemen from this draft just because of the fact that we need some blue liners. And if we look at the guys who are in the system, and we'll do that next, uh, most of them are forwards too. We don't have a lot of defensemen in the system. Yeah, and you know, like if you look at like the players the Flames drafted last year, like all of them are high skill forwards. So you know, if they any of them translate, like those are all found money type guys. And you know, if any of them even make the NHL, frankly, it's found money. So you know, if the Flames can work the same magic but on the blue line, that'd be just awesome. Well, let's talk about some of those guys. They're having some prospects who are having really good seasons in their respective junior leagues. Uh, right here in the dub in Vancouver, they've got Milos Roman, a centerman. He's got 20 goals and 19 assists for 39 total points in 43 games. I don't know if you've seen Roman play at all, but he's looking really good this year. Yeah. If there, if any like junior player is around a point per game in their draft plus one year, that's fairly good. Like, you know, it, if the, he only had like 30 points in 43 games, then that'd be a little concerning. But him being right around the point per game, that's perfectly fine. You'll be even more impressed then with Adam Rajishka in the OHL, now plays for Sudbury. He got traded from Sarnia. 50 points in 46 games so far this year. Yeah, and with his size, he should be putting up those kind of numbers. Hopefully his consistency gets better both in terms of game-to-game game and from shift-to-shift. Shift. I think that his lack of consistency... Like, when he's on, like, he can be a dynamite scorer. It's just that that shows up for maybe, like, three shifts a game. And that's the problem with him, and part of the reason why I fell to the fourth round. Because talent-wise, like, when he's on, he would have been a first-round pick. It's just... Yeah, it two up and down and hopefully he can get the consistency that needs to be the the key for him and in the qmjhl the flames now after a trade of two players playing for ramuski uh d'artagnan jolie got traded from bay como jolie now has got 16 goals 20 assists for 36 points in 47 games this year and dimitri zavgorodny we talked about earlier a left winger 23 goals, 30 assists for 53 points in 51 games. So, again, a guy getting almost point per game. Yeah. And Zav Gravny is doing very well. He's looking more like the player that at the Holinska tournament that put him on the radar instead of, like, the following season where he was kind of terrible. So, hopefully that continues. Of the junior prospects i think that zavgarovny is the most likely to become an nhl player but i'm it's still a long shot i think yeah i agree uh just running through a couple more here in the ushl martin pospisil who plays for sioux city 12 goals 30 assists for 42 total points in 32 games getting that kind that, of number in the ushl is really good yeah uh, that's dynamite and that translates very well uh hopefully he can when he moves to the ncaa that that continues and he has a very good freshman year uh, it, there's nothing to complain about with those numbers like he, he's doing what he needs to do and hopefully he continues to take additional steps forward in his development in the ncaa we have demetrius kuzmonsis a left winger for arizona state who has Two goals, 12 assists for 14 points in 30 games. Matthias Emilio Pedersen, a centerman for Denver, has six goals, 16 assists for 22 points in 25 games. And then the disappointment in the group, Mitch Matson, a centerman for Michigan State, no points in 14 games. I'm really thinking this is the end for Matson. Yeah, Matson, I think he'll be just kept on as long as he's an NCAA player and then not Yeah, he didn't signed. retain his rights, but when it comes to signing him, he's not going to get signed. No. Um, with both Kuzmanses and Pedersen, again, full marks for where they're at right now. You have to remember that in the NCAA, freshmen don't play as much generally. It, so the fact that they're even putting up near half point per game like Kuzmanses or greater than that, like Pedersen, is actually quite excellent. And, like, moving into next year, you'll probably see them be closer to a point per game, if not eclipsing that, as they're utilized more. 
Oh, yeah, probably for sure. Um, you're right. In college, the more senior you are, the more ice time you get. Yeah. It just like remember when the Flames drafted Jankowski and like he didn't really get a ton of points and like everybody freaked out that, oh, he sucks. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then the Flames have three players playing in Europe, all in men's leagues. So we have to take that into account. Linus Lindstrom uh, is playing, was playing in the SHL, got sent down to their essentially their farm league. Uh, with that league, he's got two assists and for two total points in three games. Uh, Etu Tulola, uh, right winger in the, he's playing in the Finnish league, has 28 points in 47 games. And Philip Svenningsen, also in Sweden, but in the secondary league, 21 points in 33 games. So, you know, especially for young guys, it's a hard league to play in, but I think those are, and I've watched a little bit of uh, Lindstrom and Svenningsen. They're looking okay. I mean, they're for where they were drafted, they're looking about what I'm expecting. Yeah. And, like, frankly, if any of them even make the NHL, that would be a pleasant surprise. Yeah, uh, I, I, think they'll, I think they'll all get signed, but I think they're probably AHL fodder. Yeah. It's more like uh, when the Flames signed Adam Olus Matson. It's like, you know, we need a body and you have some talent, so come play. And that's about it. I don't, I, with all three of them, I'm just not seeing enough higher end skill or consistency in Tulola's case for him to be a, an actual NHL player. And the last three names here, guys that are playing professionally, and these are the guys in the ECHL playing for Kansas City. Uh, two goaltenders and a right winger. We have Mason McDonald, who has a 12 3 1 record, 2.47 GAA, and a 9 1 1 save percentage. Those are. Pretty respectable numbers for an ECHL yeah. goalie. Yep. Yeah. He's doing all and, right. And Nick Schneider's four, six, and two with a three point eight nine GAA and eight seventy five save percentage. I I don't know for sure. I don't follow that team as much, but I imagine Schneider's jumped up and down a lot this year. He's probably just needed to be consistently in one place to get some good numbers. Yeah. And I think with all four of the goalies that they're doing all right and I don't know, like, if you keep all of them moving forward, but, you know, they're progressing in that general positive direction. McDonald, I don't know if he has any NHL potential, but goalies are always weird. Like, I don't think a single person expected Riddick to be what he is. So, you know, it's... We'll see. Like, there's no rush. It's not like the Flames have three or four guys coming in the system. Like I, I, frankly, they need to draft another goalie or two. Uh, well, and I and I could see McDonald and Schneider almost getting stays of execution, if you will, just until they have another young goalie to take their spot. Yeah, and it makes sense. You know, sign them to a one year and just keep signing them to one year until you find somebody else. Yep, or they improve where they make a name for themselves, one or the other. Yeah, I think that's going to be tough. I mean, they might improve, but I think to move above. Some of the guys we have above them in the system is going to be tough, too. I could see some of them getting moved and doing well somewhere else. But I think if you look at the goalie logjam we have, it's going to be tough to move up in this system. Yeah, I agree. And the last name is Zach Fisher, who's playing in Kansas City. He's got three goals, five assists, and eight games. I watched one Kansas City game recently, and I wasn't too impressed by Fisher, but I don't think we were ever expecting much out of him. No, and he's more of just... Your insert a rent a goon type guy with some offensive skill, so we'll see. I I would not expect he, him to make the NHL. His play style reminds me a lot of Bryce Van Braybrent. There's a name I never thought I'd say again. Yeah, that's about right. Adequate as a minor leaguer. Not anything yep. to get excited about. At least for now. Matt, I think that's all the Flames news for this week. Should we look ahead to the couple games this week? Definitely. The Flames play two games. They've got three days off. They're off on uh, the 4th, 5th, and 6th. They're back on Saddle Dome Ice on the 7th on Thursday night to take on San Jose. These are two points they desperately need to keep themselves above San Jose. That's, as always, a 7 o'clock start time. They get Friday off, and then they're making a quick road trip up to Vancouver 
on Saturday for Hockey Night in Canada, an 8 p.m. start time take on the Canucks. And those are the only two games this week. It's weird to only talk about two games in a week. Uh, then they're off until next Tuesday when they take on Tampa Bay, which we'll talk about next week. So, Matt, we got uh, two points. Last week, you and I didn't do too well in the predictions. I thought we would lose everything. You thought we'd win everything. We split. What do you think for this week? Well, I think they're going to play their first good post-break game against the Sharks because they always tend to come out against the good teams. And I think they might lose to Vancouver just because they beat San Jose. So I'm going to go with a split with San Jose win, Vancouver loss. Yeah. Who do you think is in net for those games? Do you think they're both Riddick? Riddick both, yeah. I'm uh, going to say I think Calgary will win both games. Yeah. I I think they have to beat San Jose. I think that these guys know how to get up for a big game, and I think they'll do that. And I don't – Vancouver's not a very good team, and I think if they can isolate the one guy who's any good on that team this year, um, they'll do okay. Yeah. Well, Vancouver's been playing fairly well. Like, they're in a playoff spot now, so, you know, uh, they might take them lightly. I just have this weird feeling that team's going to unravel soon. It it wouldn't shock me if, like, they actually make the playoffs and then are cannon fodder in round one and, you know, uh, and then suck next year. Like, it wouldn't surprise me. It's sort of like the 14-15 Flames where they kind of surprised everybody and then, oh, they're not actually that good. And... Yeah, when teams actually pay attention to how Vancouver is, <laughs> basically. And, yeah, I I could see them making the playoffs this year, but I think they're going to go back down afterwards. I don't think Vancouver has enough to acquire assets it require to stay in the playoffs. And I think with the, especially the Pacific being so tight, um, I can see other teams just acquiring their way in over Vancouver at the deadline, if that makes sense. Just by buying one or two rental pieces, getting those three or four points they need yeah that's very well could be like i just don't know what vancouver's going to give up to get rentals and i don't think they can go anywhere past the first round with what they've got yeah oh no well if they make the playoffs it's going to be like five maybe six games and out so we'll see well there we go we've got uh one game at home and then a four game road trip and then three more at home and then three more on the road so the team's getting their air miles this month um just an interesting thing to note the team does not play on the deadline but they're in ottawa the day before and new york the day after so uh, probably setting up a war room somewhere on the road you know you see movie stars with their trailers on the back lot i'd love to see like Trill living with a trailer in the back of the ottawa rink yeah, I think that he'd probably go ahead to New York and instead of like using the fax machine, just camp out in the lobby of the NHL headquarters. <laughs> Here, here's the trade. <laughs> just run it up there himself? Yeah. Here you That's go. That's why you've got Conroy, right? <laughs> Connie, run this up to the 18th floor. It's signed. Yeah. Knowing the NHL, they'd probably still say it's got to be faxed. Probably. So, I don't know, a lot of hotels have fax machines. Maybe just stay in the hotel, sit in the bar, and, you know, fax through the business center. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. In the, yeah, but it's it's kind of weird. I could even see, I mean, with, with that day off, I could see them. It's a 5 p.m. game the night before. I could see them even flying home, doing their business here, and flying back to New York. Yeah. I could see that as well. I think, um, I, frankly, kinda... I don't think that there will actually be any trades for Calgary on deadline day other than like a 14th forward or something like that. I think they'll if get all their is, work. If there is, I think it'll probably be a team coming from somewhere in the east. Yeah. So with the team being in the east, it might be good for that person to join us. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is uh, like the Eastern Conference playoff race is basically already set right now because like only Buffalo really has a realistic chance of making it in above any of the teams that are already in so you know the flames can basically go like they already know who to shop with basically so we'll see so you said you don't think there will be trades done at the deadline how early do you think the big moves get done uh sometime between now and tampa they have time off really yeah i think the a couple weeks early and Often the GMs that do that end up getting a better deal because they're helping to set the prices then. Yeah, exactly. 
So that would be cool if they could, uh, yeah, if they get something done. And it also gives them time to get that guy integrated into the team a little bit earlier, too. That's one thing I always worry about when you make a deadline move is you don't have as much time to get that guy integrated. Yeah. Like, if they're going to make a move for a goaltender, I think that comes in the next week, frankly. And uh, just because of the fact that, you know you want to have that guy available to you to play more than like the five or six games that he's going to play in March. So when there's some games like Florida, Arizona, Ottawa, where I can see putting that goaltender in. Exactly. So might as well get that one out of the way if you're going to go that route. So we'll see lots of time. And, but you know, it'll be interesting. Well, Matt, enjoy this week. It should be two fun games in that San Jose game. They better win. Definitely. Have a great week, Matt, and we'll talk to you on the 11th when we, uh, maybe there's a big trade by then. We'll find out. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.